Hello, this is Chandra Easton here from StarAstrologyHealing.com. Um, this is a talk um, entitled Light of Transcendence, where I discuss the uh, the nature of light and how it relates to uh, the spiritual path, looking at the subject um, through the lens of esoteric astrology and esoteric healing. Um, sit back, enjoy. The talk goes for about an hour. Uh, it was um, given originally in 2011 in Iceland. Okay, thanks. Uh, the teachings in this um, lecture are drawn from the work of Lady Ananda Tara Sharma, and specifically uh, a meditation book uh, called The 17 Steps to Perfection. It's a fantastic book that has been the most wonderful um, tool for me personally for, and for tens of thousands of people on the spiritual path who've used it. It combines esoteric astrology with meditative practices and I encourage you to uh, look for this um, website, maitreyatheosophy.org. Okay, thanks. Mind. Okay, so we have light. Uh, we know esoterically, um, the Lord Dwell Cool tells us in his book Esoteric um, Healing that there, and Esoteric Psychology, that there are seven visible rays of light. We also know from the esoteric sciences that, are, that there are three invisible rays, which will, will be revealed, I believe, over the next couple of thousand years. So at the moment, you know, we have the sort of the, the red, the gold, the green, the blue, the white. The violet, what have I forgotten? We don't count black. Black is sort of the oneness, the beginning and the end. Um, and this is the light spectrum. But what people often don't realise is that the light can be used for therapy. And as we move into the age of Aquarius, um, deeper into the age of Aquarius, which is governed by two of the streams of light, it's governed by the violet stream, which people commonly know of as the seventh ray, and you'll hear people talk about the incoming seventh ray. And what they mean is that we're having a wave of violet light coming in. And violet is the, the frequency that transforms and transcends. But we're also having a wave of blue and white light coming in through the fourth ray. And um, this, uh, these rays, as they come in, they begin to uh, affect everything on Earth. And we can use them, we can harness them. Okay, really all the rays are connected to white light. White light is the, the cosmic connection. And it's just broken down into the different frequencies um, because that's the way it can be best used. Okay, let's start from the galaxies far, far away. What on earth have they got to do with our spiritual growth? Well, everything, you know, some of the, um, the galaxies are, I don't know, thousands of light years away. Um, and yet, from a spiritual perspective, we know that time doesn't really exist. Okay? Time doesn't really exist from the buddhic plane up. It exists on the physical plane, the etheric plane, the astral plane, and the mental plane. But from the buddhic plane up, time doesn't exist. So. You know, yes, it might be so many light years away, but we can get there like that. All we have to do is get ourselves to put it plane, plane apart. Okay. 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 Um, this is a diagram that represents the triangle, the upward pointing triangle of the soul, which is open to receive one particular frequency more than another. Yeah. Um, it's a bit like, oh, I don't know, something in your garden will like a certain fertiliser. 
something else in your garden doesn't like so much water. Yeah? According to what your soul ray is, you're going to really thrive if you receive the frequency that your soul is evolving on. The other frequencies will be useful and helpful, but there's one frequency that's particularly connected to you. And if it takes you, however long it takes you to find out what that frequency is, it's worth figuring it out. Okay, and this is what we call the soul ray. Um, then we have the downward pointing triangle that's associated with the personality ray. This is our ego. Um, and that also will respond to a particular frequency. Yeah? And once the personality and the soul are in harmony, then we'll have the, the six pointed triangle in the middle, which is the balance of the personality and soul. And this takes some doing, as any of us on the spiritual path know. We go up, we down, go down, we go round about. Okay, so the energy of the Milky Way holds the 12 signs of our zodiac, but it holds also many other constellations that are not in the middle of the Milky Way, but that are around it. Okay? And these, a fundamental principle of theosophy is that every, um, every physical atom is the vehicle for soul essence. So, my body is the vehicle for my soul, and Neptune is in soul. Yeah? The planets. Can you repeat it? Um, um, every single um, physical atom, whether it's um, a planet, yeah? a solar system, um, a human person, is in soul. So you have to get used to the idea in theosophy that the, that the planet Earth has a soul, Venus has a soul, Mars has a soul, and is ensouled by um, enormous light beings. Yeah? Enormous light beings, and each one of the planets is distributing and harnessing a particular frequency or ray. And if I were a musician, I'd be also saying, and a particular note. Yeah? So when they talk about the symphony of the zodiac, they literally mean the symphony of the great beings who are healing and working through those planets. This is fundamental um, esoteric principle. Um, and you could say that um, those um, beings who've been through the Earth school of, of hard lessons and karma and completed it reside in, in the heavens. So when we, we look and we, we realise that maybe the ancestors would look to the stars for information or look to the stars for their gods, esotericists believe the same thing, but not exclusively. So we will say, okay, well, there can also be holy energy in a waterfall or, you know, in an enlightened being if they're still in their body on the earth. Okay, okay. The, what we're interested really is how can we um, capture these rays? For, because what the rays do is, th is that in the right combination, the right recipe, they speed up our evolution. Yeah? So it's important to know that angels transmit the rays also. Do angels, angels and soul clouds? Why not? Two angels and soul waterfalls and trees, why not? And we have small transmitters and enormous intergalactic transmitters. Yeah. Here's a lovely example of all the rays come through what we'd see as a stylized angel. In actual fact, the angels don't really look like that. Really what the angels look like are ever moving shades of light with focus around the eyes or the heart. Hmm. Okay, so the soul as transmitter. Remembering that we're trying to get this light down from the galaxies far, far away to my big toe yeah, and everything in between. Okay, so the soul transmits, and this is an image um, Famous artist, Danish man, I can't remember his name, he might, 
I can't see it on the picture there. Anyway, beautiful, beautiful art. And this is an image of, that he's done of the, the solar angel that overshadows one's personal self. And often people don't realise that, yes, we all have a soul, but because if I've got too much hatred, too much negativity, too much fear sitting in me, my soul actually can't come into the body. So it has to hang around. Okay? Hang around. And unfortunately, there's not enough people who are what we call soul-infused, where the soul has cleaned up and overtaken the physical and the emotional bodies and so is in, present, at home most of the time. Yeah? For most of us, the soul can, um, we can attract the soul's attention. You can do it through prayer, you can do it through meditation, you can say help. <laughs> I think help's a good one. Um, because you see there's a lot on the inner worlds of life that actually takes our soul's attention. So the things that bring our soul's attention to us are selfless service to others, um, a sincere desire to change ourselves for the better, um, a willingness to um, want to work unselfishly for the greater good, or anything we study that will bring us closer to the light of our soul. These are the kinds of things that attract our soul's attention. And if we don't do enough of that, the soul gets bored. It turns away. Huh? Unless you call help or, you know, you change, you change your habit. Okay, the planets transmit. This is what people often don't realise. Uh, this diagram is an, an attempt to show you <coughs> the, um, the rays as they're coming down um, through the planets that are circling around our sun. And then from there, through the angelic transmitters in the soul to the people. Okay? So, how are these rays caught? Which constellations, which, which zodiacal signs catch them, and how are they disseminated? Here's another diagram. You can see up the top we've got some stars in the Great Bear. Well, we were in the hot tub the other night, and Elbow was pointing out the Great Bear. Yeah. And there are stars in the Great Bear uh, that transmit the first ray. The first ray is on the soul level a deep blue and is associated with the divine will and power. Then we have three constellations, Aries, Leo and, and Capricorn, that are particularly associated with the catching. We're talking, for example, of the first ray here. I'm talking about all the rays, but about the first ray. So Aries, Leo and Capricorn particularly capture that energy. Then it comes down through the sun, and then the sun transforms and sends the energies out through all the other rays and the other planets. So you'll see the notification that says the seven sacred planets and the four non-sacred planets. It's no surprise to any, anyone on Earth to realise that we're living on one of the non-sacred planets in our soul system, we kill each other. Yeah? Yeah? So our planet's non-sacred, it's in a mess. Um, Mars is also non-sacred. Pluto is also non-sacred, and the moon. Yeah? Um, now these four planets, imagine you've got a, a classroom of, of um, 12 students, and four of them just don't want to learn, and are kicking each other, and fighting each other and not coming and generally misbehaving, the whole class can't progress till the next level until these four students get it together and cooperate. That's us. So we're holding up the solar system. We're holding up Jupiter and Saturn and Venus and Neptune and uh, uh, Vulcan. What have I forgotten? Mercury and Uranus. They've all reached a level of purity but they can't evolve. Our solar system can't move to the next level because of the four non-sacred planets. And then our solar system as a whole is holding up the galaxy. And the galaxy is then holding up the universe. So you could say that we are involved in the creation of the most enormous traffic jam. <laughs> and it's not just us. 
It's not just us, but, you know, they call us the laggards. Uh, if you read in the theosophical literature, you'll, you'll hear of the laggards on Earth. This is us. <laughs> we're late. We're late for consciousness. We're late for light. We're late for divinity. Okay, so I'm going off the track here. It's such an interesting story. But um, I guess what I would say is that there has been a, an intergalactic decision to give Earth help because they're bloody well holding up the show and they can't get it together by themselves. And they had this lesson to learn and the lesson was love. Our solar system has a lesson of love. And the people on Earth can't get it together. Okay. I won't talk about the help. I'll, go, I'll continue with the great bear. Okay. Now, the energy that comes through as a major, the great bear, is particularly streamlined and of a frequency. You know if you have a whistle that you blow that only a dog can hear? Mm -hmm. yeah? The energy from the great bear is like that. Only the... the um, the leaders of, of Earth who are in a body respond to the energy of the Great Bear. This is the, the very strong Shambhala energy. They respond to it on an individual level. The rest of us get it in group formation. Because if we got the Shambhala energy one to one, and I'd be fried. I wouldn't even have toes. Okay? It's very, very strong, powerful, dynamic energy. And it's captured by the enlightened people on Earth of whom there aren't many, okay? who then disseminate it, yeah? so it's stepped down. Now the energy, <coughs> the most potent energy is stepped down. And then the second level of energy that comes in through our solar system, and it comes through the, um, you see the bright star Sirius, the second brightest star in the southern hemisphere, um, found in the, excuse me, <coughs> it's talking about the bat right there. It's fired up my throat. <coughs> Sirius brings through an energy that the disciples can capture and are meant to capture and me meant to work with. So what I mean by the disciples are those souls who have stopped playing with the idea of getting it together and are seriously doing it life after life, rather than thinking it's a great idea and then getting involved in personal pursuits or whatever. Okay, so the disciples have a dedication to the commitment um, for the uplifting of light all over the planet. They generally have tough, hard lives, not meant to complain about it. They're the ones that are meant to catch the light of Sirius. Yeah? <coughs> and in group formation, can also work with the light of the Great Bears. And then we have the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades. And the Seven Sisters of the Pleiades disseminate a much more gentle light that the ordinary people are affected by. So we have different light for different levels of consciousness on the planet. And that's a very simplified version because really we don't fall into three nice neat groups. Yeah? We don't fall into the ordinary people, the disciples, and the enlightened ones. What happens is that there are people who are moving between the ordinary and the disciples. And unfortunately, sometimes going back the other way, but you know, generally not. Um, so sometimes we're getting a bit of both. Yeah? The energy from the Pleiades um, is a much more gentle energy. It comes through the Seven Sisters, who are known in um, old mythological literature. Okay, most of us recognise the beauty of light. Um, and occasionally we see the transcendence of it through nature. Here's a nice Icelandic light picture. Yeah? yeah. Yes. Okay, so the, the light from the galaxies far, far away is coming through the sun and then out to the planets. Yeah. And there are hordes of um, angels who work in the energy of the sun, solar angels. Now this is where you need to start thinking about um, your chart and I'll explain it as I go along here. So if you have, let's just start with Vulcan for instance, the planet Vulcan 
And I should say that if you mention the planet Vulcan to an astronomer, they'll say, what planet? It doesn't exist. There isn't such a thing. Never found a planet. Who told me there's a planet called Vulcan? <laughs> well, the esotericists believe that this planet is so close to the sun that we haven't found it yet. Okay? Lord D.K. has prophesied that it will be found um, early in the new century. Anyway, the energy of the planet Vulcan particularly comes through the sign of Taurus. So if you have the moon in Taurus, or you have the sun in Taurus, or you have Taurus rising, then Vulcan is one of the rays that is particularly connected to you. So what I'm talking about here is the moon sign, the sun sign, and the ascendant. And the, the code for this is that the moon sign, and everyone's got a moon somewhere in the chart, is where the personality prefers to be. It's the ego. One of the points of the chart where the ego is. The sun sign is the point that your soul's up to at the beginning of this life. What step were they up to on the path? Yeah? The ascendant, and everyone can find their moon and their sun, yeah? the ascendant is a point that will help your ascension into greater light. So those three are easy to work out. The one that's harder to work out is what is the soul ruler. No, no, that's, that's easy to work out too. The one that's harder to work out is what is the soul ray. So, for instance, um, if... Let's say I've got Taurus rising, yeah? Then Taurus is governed esoterically by Vulcan. And Vulcan brings in the first ray. So I would know that if I were to meditate on the meditation that an angel's given in the book, 17 Steps to Perfection, on Vulcan, that that will help me. It may not be my... my I may not be a first-ray soul, but it's going to help me because my ascendant's Taurus. Yeah. So, do you do you know what I'm? So, if a person has both both got a moon sign and the sun sign in Taurus, if they're a double Taurus, yes, yes, more than that actually. I'm talking of my daughter. Yeah. Um. Uh. So, all can be something to help her. Absolutely. Okay. It depends how old your daughter is. Twenty-one. Oh, that yeah. Well. I know. I know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But if she's interested in meditation, you see the exoteric ruler of Taurus is Venus. Yeah? The exoteric simply means the worldly ruler. But if you're looking for working with, to bring in the spiritual light, then you meditate on the soul ruler. Yeah. Okay? And it doesn't matter whether it's your moon or your sun or your ascendant. It's going to be very specific to you. Yeah? Simply because you've got Taurus in one of those three places. Okay, so does everybody know where their moon and their sun and their ascendant are? Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Do we have any Taurus people here in the room? Yeah. So where's yours? What have you got in Taurus? Taurus. Taurus ascendant, yeah. Taurus. The sun? Yeah. Sun in Taurus here, so very good. <coughs> very good for you. But you see, we're, we're complicated people. And I, I guess what, I don't want to confuse you too much, but let's say we have one ray that is the soul ray, but there are a few rays that make up our ego. <coughs> yeah? But there's only, there's only one in any one life that is the soul ray. Okay, let's move on to Jupiter. The planet Jupiter, and, and I should say that the first ray brings in the energy of divine will and the frequency is deep blue. So whenever you meditate, as soon as you close your eyes, you feel blue, that's a bit of a clue. Yeah? Whereas the energy of Jupiter transmitting the second ray is particularly connected to people with strong Aquarius because Jupiter governs Aquarius. Yeah? So that's the moon in Aquarius or the sun in Aquarius, I like sun in Aquarius, or Aquarius rising. Yeah? You can't go wrong meditating on Jupiter whenever you feel out of balance, if you've got Aquarius there. Yeah? Jupiter? Aquarius moon. Aquarius moon, yes. I meditate on the planet Jupiter, that's right. Yeah. Yes, yes. Um, and of course, you see here we have the sun in Taurus, but the moon in Aquarius. Now, the first and the second ray are very different and a bit hard to put the two of them together. 
The second ray is called the ray of love and wisdom, and it's gold. Yeah? The first ray is all about will and power, and it's blue. Yeah? So you might alternate between the Vulcan and the Jupiter. Hmm. Okay, let's talk about the planet Saturn. Um, the planet Saturn does transmit the third ray, and it's particularly, it's, it's exactly the same, very few of the rulerships are the same, exoterically as esoterically. It rules Capricorn. Yeah, on both, both, both sides, it rules Capricorn. So if you've got the moon in Capricorn, or you've got Capricorn rising, or the sun in Capricorn, then working with the energy of Saturn will be very useful for you. And the, and the energy that will come through is an emerald green, but it'll often have a pink around it. Yeah? Okay, Mercury. Now Mercury is transmitting the, and it's, it's active intelligence, okay? And, and it's, the, it's the ray of activity. Um, Mercury is connected into the fourth ray, the ray of harmony through conflict. <coughs> and being a dualistic planet, it has two signs it's connected to. It's Aries and Virgo. No, Gemini and Virgo. No. No, esoterically. Esoterically, Aries. Yeah, yes. yeah that's right. <coughs> and that's right. people often think, oh, Mercury rules Gemini. Yes, it does on a worldly level, but on an esoteric level, it's Mercury rules Aries and Virgo. And, and um, so if you've got the Moon in Aries or Virgo, or the Sun in Aries or Virgo, yeah, or the Ascendant in Aries or Virgo, you can't go wrong meditating on the planet Mercury yeah, through the 17 steps to perfection. And you'll discover if, if Amanda says in the book that she's written, um, that there's a few ways you can do it. You can either start at the front of the book and go all the way through. And the purpose for this is that this is a book that will take us to soul infusion. I don't know whether Amanda says that in the front, but anyway, that's what the book's about. If, if you work with the energy of the planets and you do, suppose you work with every planet <coughs> um, on the, <coughs> the basic exercise and the advanced one, it would take you, I don't know, three years, I think. Three years. Yeah, if you, did, if you did, let's suppose you start at the front of the book and you go all the way through, there's 17 steps, and then there's the rhythm of the universe, that's 18 months, and then you did it again with the advanced ones, it's another 18 months, yeah? So it's going to take you three years. Yeah. It would be very, very lovely to think that one could actually gain soul infusion at the end of the three years. Maybe we're not all that disciplined, yeah? But in theory... This is, this is the promise from this book, but it will take you from, not only onto the path of discipleship, but it will move you very rapidly to the point of soul infusion, which esoterically is referred to as the third initiation. And then beyond that, there's other work to do. So this book is very specific for people stepping onto the path and moving through the path. Whether it takes us three years or three lives, it's a code. It's a code book. Okay. All right. Um, now the planet Venus uh, transmits the fifth ray, called um, a love in action or concrete science, depending on how you've heard of it. Yeah. Um, and it, and it, this is the one that governs Gemini. Gemini. Hmm. So if you've got the Gemini Moon or the Gemini Sun or the Gemini Ascendant, meditate on the planet Venus. Okay. Okay. Um, and then we have Neptune. And the energy, the energy that comes through from Venus is also green, but a different green to the to the satin, satin green. It's more of a bottle green. Okay. And then we have Neptune, sacred planet of the sixth ray. And again, it governs and connects to two signs of the zodiac, Cancer and Scorpio. Yeah. So, Sun, Moon or Ascendant in Cancer, yeah. Neptune is perfect for you. Suppose you're um, the Moon in Cancer and Scorpio rising. You've got both of those. Yes? Scorpio rising. Scorpio rising. Scorpio rising. And what's the other No. No? Just like a second. Yeah. But if, for instance, you had Cancer and Scorpio strong, 
Um, I'm Aquarius, and um, Scorpio rising. Yeah. Aquarius sun. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And the question was? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Work with Neptune. You see, what you what you've got to remember is that the, that they operate. Um, once we've started to work a lot with our moon, then we can progress to working with the sun. And then we progress to working with the ascendant. And then we progress to working with the ruler of the ascendant. And then we progress to working with the soul ruler. And the last one's the hardest one to work out. Yeah? So if, you, if you've got the moon in Taurus and you meditate on Vulcan, and, and I should say at the front of the book of the 17 steps, Amanda says it, and I'm paraphrasing, don't expect that you'll have an easy month, that it will bring issues up. That's the nature of that particular meditation system, is it actually brings up personality issues <coughs> that are the opposite of the qualities you're trying to embody. Yeah? So let's suppose you've meditated on, on Vulcan, yeah? and it seems to have brought a few things up, and now you feel a bit balanced with it. Yeah? And then you start to meditate on the, whatever your sun is, It'll start all over again, you know? So it's like a house cleaning that never really finishes. And I can remember the first year I started meditating on the 17 Steps of Perfection, I used, to, I used to jump Mars, I couldn't stand it. I'd do a week, seven days, and then I'd just pipe out. I'd give up, <laughs> And anyway, some of us have, we all have different ones that we will react more strongly to. Yeah? Okay. So, so Neptune brings in idealism and devotion and is particularly suited to Cancer and Scorpio. Yeah? And then Uranus, which transmits, transmits the ceremonial um, ray, the seventh ray, the violet ray. Uh, did I say Neptune is uh, ruby red? No. Yeah. no. Okay, so Neptune's ruby red and Uranus is violet. Yeah? And Uranus is particularly suited to people with Libra. Moon Libra, Sun Libra, Libra rising. Yeah? So you should be able to look at those three and go, OK, there's at least three of these seven rays that are going to fit my moon, my sun, and my ascendant, unless you're a double person. Mm -hmm. okay? OK. So have you coloured all the, all the signs? Have, have, I, have you coloured all the signs? Have I? Yes. You forgot Sagittarius. Where is Sagittarius? Ah, ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I've forgotten Sagittarius. I have, and... That's, yes, it's a, a failing here. I was actually going through the sacred planets. But it's true to say that um, Sagittarius is governed by the Earth, which happens to be one of the non-sacred planets, which is why I didn't mention it. But there is a meditation for the Earth. Yeah? Um, so it doesn't mean to say that because you're a Sagittarian, you're more non-sacred than someone else. It doesn't mean that at all. Okay. It's, it's hard to explain, so I won't try. But, but Sagittarius is connected to the Earth. Did I leave anything else out? Aries, Taurus, Gemini, Cancer. Leo? Leo's the Sun. Did I say that Leo is connected uh, to Jupiter? No, I think I just said Aquarius, didn't I? Beg your pardon, I left the Leos out. So Jupiter governs Leo and Aquarius. <coughs> Leo, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricorn, Aquarius and Pisces. Oh, and I don't think I mentioned that the Vulcan also governs Pisces. You see, my brain's away, far, far away. Yes. So if you've got Pisces, the Sun, the Moon, or the Ascendant in Pisces, then Vulcan has a connection, but it's also associated with Pluto, because Pluto is one of the non-sacred ones. No. Non-sacred. Is, is Pisces both Vulcan and Pluto? Um, Sorry. It's technically Pluto. It's technically Pluto, but eventually we clean up our Pluto and we end up in Vulcan. Hard to explain why. <coughs> okay, because they do tend to mix and match a bit. Okay. But you, do you not talk about the house, houses in the? I won't. I won't do that tonight. No. no but this must be important if you have a. Uh, is it if you have a six sign in the Pluto on aspect of Pluto? It's it's incredibly important. It's just not what I'm talking about no, in no, the. No, no, no. Trying to I'm not quite sure what the question is. Yeah. Maybe explain. Yeah. Okay. 
Yeah, I can't really go into the detail in everyone's chart. I'm just trying to give you a bit of an overview. <coughs> yeah. <coughs> so I'm sorry if, if it doesn't take it the way you like it. Um, so when we're working with the energy of Vulcan, for instance, uh, then there are all kinds of things who are connected in to planet Vulcan. Yeah? It's a bit like, um, uh, you know, we have Icelandic people, we have Danes, we have Australians. Yeah? The planets have beings who, are, that's their home planet. Yeah? They connect there. Yeah? So that when we work with the energy of, of Vulcan, which is the first ray, well, we will connect in with the Lord Moira and the Lord... Lord Michael and Archangel Mary and so on. Okay? And the angels of justice are particularly connected uh, to the planet Vulcan, as is Joan of Arc. Yeah? And here you'll see Pluto down the bottom. <coughs> and it's hard because what I'm talking about is the cosm the, the soul the order of the solar system. It's quite large. When you say Lord Michael, you mean Mar Archangel Michael? Yes. Yes. The energy of the planet Vulcan, it's all about fire, purification of fire. The fire davids, very connected to Vulcan and the first ray. You'll see in the, the meditation book that um, what it, what, what it, the qualities that we're looking for when we meditate on Vulcan are devotion, self-sacrifice and the willingness to cooperate. And they're qualities that are particularly difficult um, if we've got, let's say, the moon in Taurus or for the Taurian energy, it, it's exactly the right medicine for Taurus. Yeah? And so these are the qualities that are guaranteed to bring up all problems associated with sacrificing the self or cooperating or devotion. So when you start to meditate on Vulcan, you often get the opposite, a bit like I was doing with my Mars. Yeah? You get the opposite. You get your shadow comes out, and if you persist, then towards the end of the month, yeah, then um, you start to move closer in that direction. That's the symbol for Vulcan. Mm -hmm. Jupiter, sacred planet of the second ray. It's Jupiter, large body, bringing in love and wisdom. And the qualities are expansiveness, kindness, and creativity. Okay? So these are exactly the qualities that are suited to the Leo and the Aquarians, yeah? who, who have a connection to Jupiter. Hmm? And you'll soon discover, if you meditate on these planets, that some of the planets seem quite easy to meditate on. And other ones are just really, for you, quite difficult. Yeah? And that's because they... The reason for this is that, that it's not just any old meditation book. It's a book that was written by um, a, a, a teacher, a spiritual teacher for the planet. So it has... Um, these are words of power. And, and in the book there are phrases to say in particular meditations. <coughs> okay. So if you're connecting to... <coughs> the planet Jupiter, or the sun meditation in the book, these are the beings that you, it's like you've dialed their number. You've run Jupiter. The Lord DK says hello. <laughs> or one of the angels of the Lord Cthulhu. You've dialed Jupiter. This is, this is their home planet. This is, you've connected in. You've said, I think I'd like some Jupiter help, please. <coughs> Buddha angels, angels who work for the Christ. Yeah? The energy of the Lady Asadara. And, and so this is what, what's so interesting about this, this um, meditation book, is that you can, one minute you're meditating on the planet Jupiter, the next thing you feel like you've got a connection around you and you don't know who it is or what it is, but you feel blissful. This is probably one of them. <laughs> I can send you this slideshow. Don't try and write it all down. <coughs> did, you, did you put Lord Maitreya also on... Vulcan. Jupiter. And, and also Vulcan. Um, no, I didn't. <coughs> yeah. Okay, so if we're meditating on Saturn and we'd like to connect and to use the energy of active intelligence more, 
when really what we're asking for is to strengthen the qualities of silence, justice and endurance within us. Yeah? So all Capricorns. Yeah? This is particularly good for them. And you could say all people who, who are aspiring to, to move to the path of discipleship. This will bring up the issues, absolutely guaranteed. And in the long run, it will help with endurance and justice and silence. There's another way that, um, as Amanda says in the book, you can start from the beginning and you go all the way through. You can do that, take the three years, or you can pick and choose whatever you like, or you can look at your chart and see which planets in my chart um, really need some work. Yeah? And you can either do that by looking at the planets on a month-to-month -month level that you're currently working with, or you can look at your natal chart and say, which is the one that's in the biggest trouble? I'll start there. Like I said, I tried my Mars. I couldn't, couldn't bear it. Okay. okay. So there's different ways of working with the book, and no, no one way is the right way. Yeah? There's the symbol that the meditation starts with when you're working with the energy of Saturn. And you see the circle of spirit up above the square of matter. Um, Saturn and also the Earth and also Vega are all connected into the third ray. Yeah? So if you meditate on the Earth, which is for Sagittarius, or you meditate on Vega, which is beyond um, our solar system, um, or you meditate on Saturn, these are some of the beings who are liable to come. Yeah? You'll get the Holy Spirit angels or the energy of the White Tara or the energy of Lord Paul the Venetian or the spirit of resurrection. And you'll start... And you, the thing about um, understanding who the beings are that come is just to pay attention to the subtleties. If you've got third-ray beings coming in a meditation or a service or a healing, they never stop moving because the third ray never stops moving. Whereas if a first ray being comes and it's blue and it won't move, it's a bit of a clue. Yeah? Okay. All right, so um, Mercury, the planet Mercury is, um, they call it the star of conflict. And it's really the planet to assist us balance all the conflicts within and without. And it governs harmony through conflict. And it's particularly associated um, with relationships. And most people think, oh, it's Venus that governs relationships. Yeah, but esoterically, it's Mercury. So if you're having a relationship problem, meditate on Mercury. And it'll show you your half of the conflict. <coughs> The qualities that you're looking for when you meditate on Mercury are this inner balance, inner strength and respectfulness. And this is the symbol. And the symbols are portals and they take you to other places. It's like if you meditate on a candle for a while, you'll go somewhere else beyond the candle. Yeah? Same thing happens with these symbols. So you can meditate with the book open in front of you. You can, Elday, I think, or the centre here has got, got them on disc yes. that you can, you can purchase in Icelandic, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's very useful. And after a while, you get to know the symbol and you know the words. And they're quite simple. And the most important thing with the seven steps to perfection is don't change the words. They're mantric words of power. You're not meant to say, I don't like that word. I'll get rid of it and put another one in. OK. Uh, Mercury, as well as Sirius, the Moon, and Ceres, all work with the fourth ray energy. So you meditate on any of those from the book, and you'll get the Ascension Angels, and you'll get the energy of the Lady Isis, or the Angels of Sirius, uh, or, for reasons I don't quite understand, extraterrestrials seem to come in through Mercury and Uranus. Yeah. Okay. A Venus. That we could sign Aries and Virgo for Mercury. Mm. Yeah, or anything on the fourth ray. Hmm. Well, say you've been <coughs> using the meditations on the discs 
and you have no problem with mercury meditation, you mm -hmm. like it, and you have problem with the moon meditation. Mm -hmm. It's they're sort of still presenting the same power in a sense, or maybe not. Um. It would probably happen the other way around, and it's hard to explain why, except that the Moon is a non-sacred planet. And so, as I said, we're working through the Moon, then the Sun, then the Ascendant, then the ruler of the Ascendant, in an ascending order. So if I start with the Moon, for instance, yeah, I am working with fourth ray energy, and maybe I've got some of that under control, and then I try and shift to Mercury, and, and maybe I've got Aries rising, and all of a sudden it's bringing in a higher frequency of the fourth ray, and that might upset me. Can it's, it be the other way around? It can be, because it's very specific. You, you see, I'm talking in broad general yeah, terms, yeah, yeah. but everyone's chart's different. Yeah. If you've got a moon mercury square, for instance, it, you won't be able to do either of them easily. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's very specific to our own because we have various degrees which we have um, mastered or not mastered the energies of these planets. And we don't know until we start meditating on them how easy or difficult they are. Okay. So the fifth ray, this is a, a picture I found on the internet of um, uh, inspiration of the conclave on Venus. I just thought it was quite lovely. You can see there's this sort of old man. Obviously, people think of God as the old man sitting up the back. Yeah. So Venus will bring us the energy of truth. Very beautiful planet. <clears throat> Particularly associated with love, loyalty and goodness. These are the qualities. <clears throat> And again, the portal that takes us to Venus will take us to the energy of unconditional love. Yes, and so with this fifth ray energy, love in action, yeah, also governs Minerva. And some of the beings, angels of purity, angels of truth, the energy of the Lady Pallas Athena, Lord Hilarion, the uh, beings from the, the ashram on Crete. Neptune brings in the sixth ray of idealism and devotion. <clears throat> and I suppose I could say that generally speaking, because we've left the Piscean Age and we're moving into the Aquarian Age, uh, the Lord DK says that we have a great influx of second ray souls coming to the earth for the next 2,000 years and an increasing influx of fourth ray souls. Whereas in the previous age, we've had a lot of sixth ray souls. But as the sixth, the sixth ray is finishing and the seventh ray is coming in, this is what Lord DK says, that we, we are, there are large amounts of second ray souls coming to learn about love, an increasing amount of um, fourth ray souls who, who have this intergalactic connection, who may not have had that many lifetimes on Earth, who are here to help us resolve our conflicts so we can move this planet to sacred. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm off the track again. So, if you meditate on Neptune, then what you're looking for is greater purity in your life, strengthening your intuition, <coughs> and getting a sense of unity and connection between you and your soul. This is the symbol uh, to meditate upon it. Uh, um, the very, one of the very first times that I meditated on the planet Neptune, I didn't know at that point that I had six stray soul. I would have said to you, like I said, I'm not interested in religion, mm. even though the six stray is the ray of devotion. So I spent, you know, until I was at 30, closing any book that had the word God in it, emphatically. Didn't realise I was in reaction, I just didn't like those books. <laughs> anyway, um, so I didn't know that I had a six straight soul, didn't know that I had a strong connection to the Lord Jesus, but I found this book, decided I'd meet that on Neptune. I had a very profound connection with the Lord Jesus, 
by what I'm certain was the Sea of Galilee. And if you, if you meditate on Neptune, you know, um, it can take you to all kinds of places. That just happened to be my particular experience, you know. And it cracked something in me, some of this, I don't believe in God, um, do you know what I mean? It, it broke something, one of my ego's resistance bar- barriers that I didn't even know that I was trying to break. I had no idea. I just, I just knew that meditation was going to help because I hit a brick wall trying to study things. Yeah. And everybody's experiences are very different. But I had a very profound connection and then <coughs> started to realise that I had the, the sixth ray. And of course, Mars is on the sixth ray too. So I'm having all these problems with Mars and having a wonderful, exalted experience meditating on Neptune. It took me a while to put the two together and go, oh, God, I've got a bit of work to do around the sixth ray. Okay, so the beings that we connect to through the sixth ray, the Lady Magdalene, the Lord Jesus, and the angels of forgiveness. And these are just some of the beings. There's so many more. One of these days I'll make a list. Okay, the planet Uranus brings in the violet. Seventh ray, very good for the Librans. I like this picture of Uranus. It's very space-like. If you're working with Uranus, really what you're looking for is non-attachment, discrimination, and the capacity to give. Very good for the Librans. There's the symbol. And who comes when you meditate on Uranus, the violet fire angels, and also the Holy Spirit angels. They'll move quite happily between the, <coughs> the third and the seventh ray. The energy of the Lady Portia, the energy of the Lord Master R, and the intergalactic, as I said, are connected into Uranus and Mercury. Oh, and the other thing that um, happens when we meditate upon Mercury is that we connect into the, the deities who hold sacred space. Yeah, so in Australia, um, we can connect into the Aboriginal ancestors. Yeah? Here you probably connect into um, through your sagas. Yeah? This is through Mercury. Yeah? You'll connect into the deities who hold sacred space. Speaking of sacred spaces, that's a, a Golfos photograph that I found. Hi. Do you have any questions? So far. Um, yeah. Where is the ascendant? Where is the ascendant? It's the arrow on the side. So you the Sagittarius. So your formula is. Sun in Leo, so that's Jupiter. The moon in Cancer is Neptune. Yeah. And the Earth, Carbon and Sagittarius. So then we the three yeah. ones. Yes. So they're on here on the cards. Why don't you have That was a cold. We're here in Aquarian with Scorpio yeah. rising. Mm-hmm. And where's the moon? I can't remember. Do you want me to look you up? Okay, you go. <laughs> Can I just take a minute and look her up? Can I just... Um, what, what I have your chart in my computer. How do you spell your name? How do you spell your name? Let me see. G U D N Y. D A L Y. Okay, I don't know if it's there. Let's find out. It says the year 2000. No, it's not there. Okay. I can't Australia. Okay. Okay, what's your date of birth, Goodney? Uh, 27th of January. In Reykjavik? Yes. And what time? Uh, or 2, 9 or, or 14. <laughs> after midnight. 14 minutes after no, midnight? Uh, 2 in the morning. Oh, oh 2, 14. Yeah. Okay. 14. Yep. Don't oh, you don't remember? Um, oh, we'll find out if it's the wrong one. That's it. You're right. So there's your chart. Yes. 
sound like a curse? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't ask you. Do you mind if I put your chart up there? <laughs> There's a, the sun in Aquarius, yeah. the moon's in Pisces, and Scorpio's rising. Yeah. So your sun in Aquarius says meditate on Jupiter. Mm -hmm. And then you have Jupiter on top of the sun. So that tells me that you have good karma and grace with the energy of Jupiter. Mm -hmm. So this is where it gets contradictory. And then you have the moon in Pisces, mm -hmm. which is meditate on Pluto. Yeah. And then you have Scorpio rising. I did those things. Hey? Yeah. yeah, Scorpio rising, which gives the, the, the ruler of Mars. So you've got to work on Jupiter, Mars and Pluto. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's just one example. Everybody's chart is very different. Mm -hmm. And it's quite interesting to see other people's charts. And, and if you don't know, it's the blue lines in the chart that are all the good karma, mm -hmm. and the red lines in the chart that are the work we have to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And most of us have got a, an interesting combination thereof. And the fortunate thing is that we're not meant to work it all out in any one year. That there's particular cycles. That, that every year there's, there's certain lessons to work out. OK. Thank you. Oh, that's all right? Yeah. OK, so how do you find your soul ray? Um, I've got a little booklet, I don't, know whether, I don't think I brought any here this year, called, um, what's it called? I've forgotten, The Joy of Service. Have you seen that little booklet? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wrote it last time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that little booklet, um, I've tried to compile a lot of the information about a service working on behalf of your soul as opposed to just having a career, mm -hmm. yeah, vocational service. And in it, I've put some of the guidelines and ways to help you identify what your soul ray is. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can always email me and I can send you a PDF or something like that. You know, I have it as a PDF I can send or, or you, can, you can buy it, whatever. But how, how to find out what the soul ray is? One of the strongest ways is to see what connections you have through the work. Yeah? So that if you feel a very strong calling to um, work as a teacher, but you don't know how to do it, and you, you feel very anxious about it, and you feel like you can't do it, then it's a goal that's ahead of you. Yeah? Whereas if you feel like, I'm currently a teacher, and I do it quite well, and yes, there's other things that I could learn, but it's not something that's calling me, then it's probably something you've integrated from the past. And the past will be part of your soul ray, or of your personality ray, and the future challenges are part of your soul ray. Yeah? Like, like, for instance, um, uh, I'll talk to anybody about anything. You know, um, I have a second ray personality, which is the second ray, pe second ray people are, they like people. Yeah? I've got the sun and, sun and Aquarius, so I've got a, a strong ability to talk to people, and I've had that all my life. Didn't have to develop it, you know? Could never shut me up. Yeah? <laughs> talk to anybody, yeah? Um, everybody's got parts of their personality that's been with them their whole life, yeah? So it was very easy and obvious to me to have a career where I talk to people, because that's give my family some relief. <laughs> Um, my kids to this day cannot understand that people pay me for me to talk to them. They think it's the <laughs> biggest mystery under the sun because they pay to shut me up. <laughs> so I just to use that as an example of my second ray personality. Yeah? Um, because the second ray is love and wisdom, generally good with people and very interested in books. So you can pick someone who's got strong second ray. You walk into a house and they've got books. Wow, second row somewhere here. Yeah. Um, whereas, for instance, my movement to the mystical, to the spiritual path, into any church, was full of, oh, 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 will I, will I, will I, will I? Yeah. Very, very difficult. And I actively avoided it until I managed to avoid it. Although my mother says that I was the only child that insisted on going to Sunday school, and she was trying to keep me away from it. But then something happened, I don't know what. So if you look at your own life, you can see 
an area of your life that you avoid. You know? If it's the sixth ray, if your soul ray is the sixth ray like mine, you'll have big issues with religion. Big issues. If your soul ray is the fifth ray, you'll have big issues with things like science or knowledge or the rational mind. Because we all have big issues where our soul ray is. If your soul ray is the fourth ray, you'll have big issues with resolving conflict or big issues with creativity and the manifesting of it. Yeah? So you always look for where some of the biggest problems are. If you're trying to say, well, the seven rays, which ones do I feel comfortable with and which ones are potentially harder to work out? The harder ones are generally connected to the soul ray. The, another clue to, to identifying your soul ray is to see, follow your career change. Yeah? So I work now, I talk to people, but I also work as a spiritual healer. That wouldn't have developed if I hadn't have been making movement towards the sixth ray, the idealism and devotion. Yeah? Whereas somebody else might have worked as a healer from a very young age, a doctor or whatever, and they're moving gradually towards being an artist. Yeah? So the artists are on the fourth ray. Yeah? So there's something about, and what I'm talking about here is the, the science of esoteric psychology and the planets. Esoteric astrology and esoteric psychology, they kind of merge like that. So there's lots of clues. The kind of work you do or the kind of work you're called to do. Yeah? The attraction that you have to particular colours. Yeah. Or particular... Um, yeah. Yes? Yes, yes, yes. I'm always very red. Always very red? Mm. Yeah. Jesus and mm. Mm. And you see, I wear a lot of blue, yeah. and I haven't got the fourth ray soul, but I've got fourth ray very strong, and I work for spiritual hierarchy with the fourth ray. Mm. I have very strong areas in my chart, and I work for, the, for Lady Isis. And so I, I wear those colours, even though I'm not a fourth ray soul. And in fact, there's not as many fourth ray souls on the planet at the moment as there will be in 100 or 200 years' time. Yeah. Um, the ascendant and the ruler is another key. So let's, can I just use someone's chart as an example, if you don't mind me saying things in public, it might embarrass you. <laughs> okay, so um, Helga has the, the sun in Leo. Uh, and she has the moon in Cancer. And then she has Sagittarius rising. Okay. So the fact that she's got the sun in Leo... I'm going to stare at it for a little minute. It's, it's hard to talk in general terms. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to talk in a simple way because there's two systems of rulership. If I look at the chart, there's one system that governs the personality in the chart and one system that governs the soul. And so if I, if I just focus on the soul energy, all right? She has Sagittarius rising. Sagittarius is connected to the third ray. Yeah? So we would know that anything that Helga does um, with the energy of Saturn or if her, in her healing she works with the Holy Spirit angels or the White Tara, then she's been true to her third ray, Sagittarius. Yeah? That's not necessarily her soul ray, but it's a path to take her. Yeah? And then I look further and I see that the Earth, which is the ruling planet of her Sagittarius, is in the sign of Aquarius. Yeah? Now Aquarius holds the second ray and a bit of the fifth ray. I won't explain why, it's too hard to explain why, but um, I look at it and I think, okay, well, there's something about the second ray as the Earth sits in Aquarius. So if she was to meditate on a combination of the second and the third ray, they will progress her further on the path. Yeah? So if you were to meditate upon the Earth in the 17 steps, or Saturn, or Jupiter, yeah? those three that have got the connection to the second and the third ray, that will move you forward. In order to ascertain the soul ray, then we have to say, well, what's the kind of vocational work that she'd love to be doing? So I'll ask her the question. What do you do now for a job? I'm, I'm, I'm an office. Okay, so people who work in offices, 
People who work in offices have strong seventh tray somewhere. Okay? Administrative office work has a connection to the seventh tray. Well, we say, what would you like to do? Uh, I like my work. Okay. And I also work as a healer in the healing center. And yes, yeah, so okay. People. So working with the healing energy, there's different ways of working with healing. You can work with healing through the fifth ray as a doctor, or you can work with healing through the second ray as a counsellor, or you can work with healing through a few rays as a spiritual healer. Yeah. So it's a case of, of... I think I do as earth healing. Yes. And you see, the earth healing is because of the seventh ray that I was talking about. It's a fairly good chance that Helga's got some seventh ray somewhere in her personality bodies. It might, be, might govern her physical body, it might govern her, her personality, but she's got the seventh ray somewhere, and it sits in the cancer part of the chart. The other thing that um, is very useful, and as you can see, it's incredibly complicated, you know, and everyone's chart's different. Another thing that's very useful is to pay attention to the, um, the symbols um, that come if you meditate. If you meditate and say, what's my soul ray? One person might get a blue star. Uh, if a teacher, can it be a blue star? Depends what they teach. Children. Uh, most things they have to learn to Hmm. You see, teachers, in order for a, a teacher of Sunday school, or a teacher of mysticism, or a teacher of spirituality, would have the sixth ray. Okay? Whereas a teacher of children on its own is probably more second, the third, or the fifth. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, if you ask, if you meditate and you ask, "What's my soul ray?" Show me in a colour or a symbol. Yeah. But if you know which colours or symbols connect to which rays, you can work out the code. Okay? So, for instance, if you say, what's the work that I'd love to do, and you, and you write that down, um, then what's the symbol that colour comes through, and what's the, the master that I'm connected to? And you may not, you might find that if you read about the different lords and ladies of the hierarchy, there'll be one or two in particular that you feel very attracted to. You don't know why. Yeah? And generally, it'll be because they are connected to a planet, connected to a ray that you have an affinity with, either for your future work or from past lives. Hmm. And then there's the soul stanzas that are in this little book, Joy of Service, but they're really, they're initially in Esoteric Psychology 2 by the Lord Dwight Pool. If you've seen the these are little stanzas um, that, that are very descriptive of the tests and challenges for the soul on the different rungs. Yeah? And often when you read them, and I've, I've run workshops where if you read them, it can, you can have a very strong affinity to one of them. They're like, they're like old-fashioned poems, I suppose. And some of them feel like they're talking just to you. And other ones, you read it and it just doesn't connect. You know? So if you go, if you pick up esoteric psychology and look for the soul stanzas, you can look in the thing in the back of the book, you can begin to identify two or three of the rays where your soul might be. Yeah? So you narrow it down. And then you look at your chart. Yeah? And you can narrow it down. And then you meditate on it and you narrow it down. And then you look at what your vocation is. 